and you all are clapping and being lovely while my micro while my clicker just stopped so i'm going to i'm going to be rubbish for exactly a second probably more than a second cool good morning is everybody feeling wonderful today <laughs> Y'all are some very polite liars. You're like, yeah, everything's fine. Oh. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you about sort of automating access to development today. Uh, but first, I thought I'd introduce myself really quickly. My name's Jessica Rose. Uh, I'm originally from the US, and I'm based in the UK now. So when I'm in Europe, I often have to apologize for being a little bit too happy but I'm based in the UK now, so mostly I'm just tired and grumpy, and will probably be a little tired and grumpy for the next couple of days, unless anybody has spare EU passports, in which case, please see me after the talk. <laughs> uh, I imagine everybody's feeling especially good because I specifically requested the hangover keynote. This is my favorite slot in any conference. I think this is the one slot where everybody who shows up is going to be really, really mellow and really compliant. And that sounds creepy. And it's actually even creepier because this comes from me having been a teacher. Uh, I was a language teacher and a linguist for a long time, so I really like to run talks that are a little bit interactive. I'll probably make you raise your hands. I'll probably ask you some questions. I'm sorry in advance. Uh, who here is a native speaker of English? If English is your first language, can you go ahead and raise your eyebrows? Cool. Uh, for those of you who aren't native speakers of English, I'm aware that I speak very, very quickly, and I'm sorry. If I say something you don't understand, or if it was too fast, just go like this with your hand. Nobody else is looking at you, nobody else is going to see it, but I'll go ahead and just say what I said over again. And if something I sa say sounds really, really dumb, if you're like, no, Jess, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, you don't have to wait to tell me that's dumb. So my Twitter handle's at the bottom of every slides, so you can go ahead and tweet and be like, Jess, that was the stupidest thing I've ever heard, get off the stage. I won't see it till later, so go ahead. Um, and my DMs are open, so if you want to have a conversation about anything I've said, I'd be really, really excited to. Um, I've got two microphones today, not because I'm especially vain, but I am. Uh, just because we've got one for the room and one for the camera. So if any of you ask any questions or have anything really interesting to say, I'm probably going to go ahead and repeat it over again, not to freak you out, but just to make sure that the camera's got it as well. So I'm the head of developer relations at Dream Factory. And I feel really, really confident saying this because I don't think anybody from my company is going to watch this talk. Developer relations is this ridiculous, wonderful job that probably shouldn't exist. I get to travel around the world and talk to really, really beautiful developers, really interesting people about what they're building. And it's kind of the best possible job I could ever have. And when people asked if I wanted to keynote this talk, I was especially excited because Dream Factory and Drupal have a little bit of a special relationship. So we've just rebuilt our website in Drupal, and actually our free hosted version is in Drupal as well. So we've got a really cool open source pro project that sort of acts as a platform that lets you automatically generate REST API. We've had a really, really fun time sort of moving everything into Drupal, and we really love Drupal. Mostly. <laughs> I think any time you've got a big site migration into Drupal, things are a little bit stressful for a little while. So there have been some bumps and there's been some challenges and maybe a little bit of swearing at the interface. But at the end of the day, I think we came out of it still pretty in love with Drupal. And really thinking about the way Drupal enables developers to, and not non-developers, the way Drupal lets people build what they need now is what got me thinking about this talk in the first place. I think in technology, we always talk about failure. We talk about failure as being this great thing. Oh, go fast, fail fast. We understand, we say we understand the value of failure, but I think we don't really. 
Who here in your jobs, who says, do you know what, I feel like my company is giving me a lot of time. I feel like I have a lot of time to explore things and fail whenever I want to. Oh, you, you should probably come up afterwards and tell us where you work. I think we understand the value of failure, but business needs often get in the way. We don't really give ourselves the time to fail and learn that we might like. And I think that's interesting because in technology, we're really interested in individual stories. We care about people's names. We all know who created Facebook. We all know who's running Yahoo. We all know who's running Microsoft. We know these big, glorious personalities. And I think that that might lose track of, ah, that might lose track of my clicker. I think that might lose track of the way we really work in technology. I think the way that we work in technology is collaborative. When you say, oh wow, look at what Zuckerberg has built. You say, well, look at what this figurehead has built on top of this massive organization, on top of this huge team. And that's really what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how automation can help us succeed as individuals and help us succeed as small teams. Traditionally, you've needed a pretty big company behind you to become big or to scale. And I think that's changing a lot. I hate this clicker. So who here, just to get your hands up, just to get in sort of in teacher mode, who works for yourself? Who's the only person on your team? Oh, cool. Who works for a team of less than 50 people? Okay. Who works for a team of more than 50 people? All right. Slightly less relevant for y'all, but you should probably stay. It'll still be funny in parts. You, y'all have been doing all right for a while. So traditionally, these massive companies have had huge advantages over the smaller players. And even in technology, where we like to talk about startups, we like to talk about the scrappy underdogs making it, realistically, you needed a lot of things to scale and succeed. To really build and scale and compete on the global market, you needed, look, you needed access to some crazy stuff. You usually needed to buy a lot of hardware back in the day. Tooling has been so expensive, and that's only starting to change now. And I think the most challenging thing is you really needed skill sets that covered everything you needed to do. Whether it's internally or whether you outsourced, you needed somebody who knew how to do all of the things. And to get those skills, you needed time. But every single one of these points, really at the end of the day, you needed money to get the space to build things. You needed money to get the space to get equipment. I think that's still true, but maybe that's a little bit less true than it used to be. I'm not going to pretend that everything's suddenly fair and everybody's idea has equal share in the marketplace. But I think that maybe, just maybe, we've got the opportunity to leverage one of several things that are changing right now to have a little bit of a more equal share in the tech market. I'm very clearly going to talk to you about automation, so I've kind of put that up there as a spoiler. But I think there are four things that have changed in the technology industry that really make it so much more accessible for individual developers and so much more accessible for small teams. I think one of the big ones is shared infrastructure. You don't need to buy anything physical anymore. If you want to just get some more AWS credit and spin something new up, go nuts. If that's not working, just cancel it. Shared infrastructure gives you an amazing chance to sort of pay as you go to get what you need to scale. As a former teacher, I love this. Access to educational materials are so easy right now. Who has a computer science degree? Who does not have a computer science degree? Who learns awesome weird stuff off the internet for free? Yeah. Uh, for those of you on the video, I think maybe, uh, maybe a fifth of people had a computer science degree and almost everybody is learning cool weird stuff on the internet. I'm really excited about this one as well. I think if you catch me next year, I'll probably be giving a talk about how open source and low cost tooling is the future. Open source tooling is one of the most beautiful things that happened. Like I'm a massive open source true believer and open source dev tools have been brilliant. 
but I promised on the little abstract to talk to you all about automation. And I think when I'm going to talk to you about automation, I'm going to talk to you about it in a really general sense. So who here is automating any part of your development process? Who's using automation at any stage? So we've got maybe 60% of people. I love when they videotape this, because I could be saying anything. They can't see the crowd. I'd be like, oh, 100% of people agree with me. Everyone laughed. This is going so well. And when I talk about automation, I've heard people come up very pithily to say, oh, do you know what automation? Automation is a way to fail faster. And I think this is true. Automation is absolutely a way to fail faster. And I think this is the most important part of automation. Yeah, automation lets you stop doing the work you hate or stop doing the work that's not valuable. But the thing I care about is automation lets you fail faster at the things you don't need to do. So you can spend your time really focusing and failing more and learning more at the things that are valuable for you and your team. And this probably sounds kind of weird, so I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour of what I think is valuable about failure. I really like the idea that we've got a cycle of investment through failure. I like this because investment is one of those keywords your boss likes. If you say, I need more time to fail at things and learn things, your boss is probably going to get a... But if you say, oh no, I saw this talk about a cycle of investment through failure, that's good business ease. I'd roll with that. At the end of the day, I'm talking to you about X. X is anything that needs doing or knowing. This can be creating a front end. This can be talking to your database. This can be creating REST API. I don't care what it is you need to do. Whatever you need to do, the task that you need done, let's say that's X. And let's say in this imaginary example, it is so important for me to know how to do X. I need to know how to do the thing. Okay. It's important for me to know how to do this, and I don't have the skills yet. I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot. And realistically, I'm going to fail at that. Which is mostly fine. I'll probably be a little bit pissed off. I'll probably fuss at my computer a bit. I'm going to try and do it again. And let's be realistic. I'm going to fail again. And if we were being honest, this slide would keep going for the rest of the talk. I'd probably try and fail at a new skill for up to a week and a half, probably have a drink, probably have a cry. But you're just going to keep failing again and again. And this sounds really depressing. And this is really great. By the time I get there, when I'm trying to do the thing, and I've got it, I've gone through this cycle of depending on the task, fairly miserable to soul-destroying failure, at the end of it, I have a new skill or even a new skill set. I've invested time in these miserable, gently frustrating failures, but through that brought really, really valuable insight, valuable knowledge, not just to myself, but to my team and project. Next time we have a problem that looks like X, we've got the skills in-house. We've invested in that failure, and we're done. But automation is great for when you don't care about how to do the thing. Let's say it's something you already know how to do, or it's something that's not really core to your business. I'm not telling you you don't need to understand it. You should always understand what you're doing, but you don't know, always need to know how to do it. Let's say I need to do something that's not a core part of my business. It needs doing, it's part of my project, but I, sh I don't really have to do it myself. I'm just going to automate that. I'm going to find a project or a product or I'm going to make something myself that just does the thing. It's going to do it for me. I'm done. I could go ahead and move on and move back to focusing on really valuable failures. But realistically, I'm probably going to play Civ 5 for an hour and then move on learning cool, important things. Automation gives you an incredible opportunity 
not just to clear up more time for you as a person, to sort of carve back a little bit more of a work-life balance. Automation gives you the chance to focus on learning the things and failing at the things that are really important for you, your team, your business, and really, it's going to get, leave you in a place where you're able to keep talent in-house more often. Who here has left a job because you weren't learning anything? Yeah, oh, this is better than most places. So about a fourth of people have left jobs because you weren't learning. What if you could have automated the tasks that you were doing that weren't valuable to you and focused on learning more? It's a really, really great opportunity to clear things up and give you more space to do what you care about. So the two big things I hear when I talk about automation are, oh, you want to fail faster, which yes, 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 yes. And then I hear, oh, automation. You mean automated testing. And yes, I mean automated testing because testing manually is pretty miserable. But when I talk about automation, I'm thinking about a much bigger picture. I'm thinking about automation in a much more fundamental sense. So I'm just going to walk through a couple examples of what I mean when I'm talking about automation. And these are off-the-shelf ideas. These are off-the-shelf things that exist now. If you want to build something yourself that automates things I've never thought of automating, do that. It's going to be amazing. If it's not amazing, come and fuss at me. When I talk about the concept of automation, I always like to talk about IFTTT first. Has anybody used IFTTT? I am absolutely in love with this. And this is usually what I talk to non-technical audiences about first when I talk about automation. IFTTT is just a really incredible project that lets you connect things. So when I'm talking about automation, I just mean something that happens without me having to be involved. Sort of a set it and forget it, ideally. IFTTT gives you the chance to connect things. Say, do you know what? Whenever I put a photo on Instagram, could you go ahead and save that and put it someplace ridiculous? Or, hey, if I get an email, can you flicker the lights in my living room on and off? You can do weird, insane, dumb things with IFTTT. Is anybody using it for business at the moment? Is anybody using it for fun, weird projects at home? Yeah. If anybody has business applications I haven't thought about for this, come and tell me about it, because I'd love an excuse to use this more. I think if I gave a talk about automation and didn't mention Dream Factory, I would probably get fired. Um, Dream Factory is a platform that lets you automatically generate REST API at scale. Uh, there's a free open source product for it, and it's one of those cool things where I'm really, really into it, but if I was going to be really honest, I'm a little bit biased. I think Dream Factory is great, but I might suggest checking it out yourselves. And if you hate it, have a fuss at me and say, Jess, don't mention that on stage. If you love it, probably have a fuss at my company and say, that was quite cool. I really, really love technology. And I really, really hate a couple small things that I have to do as part of my work in technology. Does anybody really, really love the deployment process? <laughs> uh, two people raise their hands. Three people. All right. Uh, apparently, three people have nothing in common with me. Uh, I hate it a lot. Uh, and BuildBot is a really nice free open source project that automates a lot of the core issues that I really, really hate. Um, I'm not sure. Has anybody ever used BuildBot? Yeah, have you used it with a Drupal project? Okay. Madness. Oh, oh hate or love? I feel like I'm going to make you come to all of my talks on automation in the future. So the point behind using BillBot, the thing that makes it wonderful, is that you just push a button and all the magic happens. And I think in a perfect world, that's what we want from processes we don't really need to be involved with. I'm absolutely obsessed with RMAD right now. So rapid mobile app development is my favorite thing for stuff clients don't have to see. 
And I know a lot of developers are, oh, it's not real development, but psh, it's great. Uh, it's a really interesting way to just drag and drop things you need doing. If you need to make internal apps, if you need to make things for your partner, if you need to make things for your family, if you need to make things for your class, if you need to make anything that doesn't have to look beautiful, RMAT is a really great way to make something now. For me, I think automation in technology often gets defined in a really narrow scope. We say, hey, Automation are the things that the testing department does. Automation are these custom scripts we write. Automation is this little tiny part of technology. And really, when I talk about automation, I want us to look at automation as anything that we can kind of set and forget. Anything that we can set up to do the work for us. I kind of like this selfishly because it makes a whole lot more of technology look like automation. I think if we're looking at automation as something that does the work for us, you get the chance to look at a lot of really interesting, really cool projects that are taking over the web and taking over technology, and look at them in the context of automation. Let's say, hypothetically, you've got something that goes ahead and does a lot of the front end work for you. I don't know, hypothetically, something that's just come out with a nice new release. Things like Drupal give people a really, really wonderful chance not just to access building things, not just to build things from a range of different skill sets, but to build things powerfully and flexibly while investing their time in other parts of the project that might be more valuable for them. I think projects like Drupal should absolutely count as automating core parts of the development process. I think. Oftentimes when we look at what development is and what technology is, a lot of people are looking at it as purists. We want to say, oh, to be a technologist, you have to be staring nervously at the terminal, swearing quietly at a hoodie. No. I think that any time you're building using technological tools, I think any time you're using really, really brilliant processes and brilliant projects, this is development, and this is what technology really means. You've gotten a 30-minute rant about why failure is amazing, and why automation is amazing, and why I'd quite like Drupal to be considered automated processes. But at the end of the day, even though automation has this incredible potential to make development more accessible for independent developers, and to make development and technology more accessible for folks without a lot of capital, it's not the only thing we need to get sort of a true meritocracy going. I would love to tell you that low cost and free education, open source tools, shared infrastructure and automation, I would love if I could tell you that these things are gonna let you compete against Microsoft, or these things are gonna let you compete against Google. But I'm a terrible liar, and I don't think y'all are silly enough to believe that. At the end of the day, capital still matters, and capital is going to continue to matter for some time. If we want to create a true meritocracy in technology, alongside automation and alongside education, I think longer term we're going to have to have a think about how we, get, how we distribute capital, how we value companies, how we value projects. If we want things to be a little bit more fair, I think that we have to pay attention to things people are building outside of Silicon Valley, outside of San Francisco, outside of New York. I think that projects being judged on their merits and being allocated capital accordingly would be a beautiful way to move forward. And for independent and small developers, cultural and structural barriers are going to continue to remain barriers. I think a lot of the way we value talent, a lot of the way we value potential, it's tied inexplicably and almost impossibly tied to capital until we start looking at talent separated from the culture we've built and separated from what expectations we have on different profiles. It's still going to be a little bit unfair. I don't think that developers are lazy. I think that humans are lazy. I think that we like to cut corners wherever we can. And I think that's one of the best things about automation. As a human, and as a lazy human, I love when technology does things for me. 
I love when folks take the things I hate to do and just ma make them magically happen. But at the end of the day, the energy we're saving through automating and the energy we're saving through using open source projects and shared tooling and shared infrastructure, if we want a better technology industry, we probably have to be taking that energy and putting it back into supporting each other better. We can automate so many parts of technology. We can scale things so beautifully. But we can't really scale human relationships very well at all. I think at the end of the day, looking out for each other and caring for each other is going to be what really makes technology more accessible for independent developers and those small shops. Thank you so much. If this talk was any good, you should probably use the Twitter handle at the top to say hi. If it was terrible, please ignore that and chat directly to me. But I think the things that are really, really important are going to be the examples I've given this afternoon. Jesus. The examples I've given this morning. I think it's going to be a very, very challenging day. Um, and I'm always looking to add to this list. So if you're using a really interesting, really different mode of automation in your development process, I'd love to have a chat with you about it. Thank you so much. So I've, oh, I've kind of hurried a little bit because I think just listening to me talk is quite boring. I would love to hear more, either any questions you have, or I would love to hear about what you all are doing with automation or what you care about with automation. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? <laughs> oh, um. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's great. So it, um, if I can recap the question, it sounds a bit like you're saying um, uh, you like the idea of Drupal as framing Drupal as automation, but it's not really a set it and forget it automated process it's like IFTTT. Um, I think that, so for me, and this is very, very much opinion, and this could very much be wrong, and this could very much be silly. Uh, for me, the things that I consider automation in Drupal are you do have to go through and set things and select things and enter, enter your content. But it's automating so much of this, it's building out a great part of what you're going to be showing the end user. I think when we're looking at automation, a lot of times the, the sort of end-to-end -end process is really tempting to look at as the definition of automation. And for me, I'd really like to look at it as a larger anything that does a big chunk of the work for us. So I think it's a, it's a very, very different definition of automation that might be a bit weird. So that's actually something I've been thinking about a lot. I was just up uh, talking to a financial services company, and they're a massive, massive company, and they were saying, you know what, we've, we've got all of our QA and testing people embedded within Teams. And they were talking about automation in the sense of testing, and they were saying, do you know what, it's difficult because everybody will build their own automation, and it lives with the team. 
So they had replication of the same sorts of processes, the same kinds of tools being built again and again and again across this giant organization. And I think it gets even more challenging when you look at a community overall or individual developers, because you have people building their own automated processes, building their own automated tools. And the procedure to share those and exchange those, I don't think there's a really good tr marketplace for that at the moment. And I don't think even necessarily there's a really good framework for open source projects to be sharing those. Um, yeah, I'd be really, really interested to see larger conversations around automation for one-offs to say, hey, I built this one specific weird thing. I'd love to see an open source Amazon for, um, for automation. <laughs> oh, did anybody else have any questions or comments? I'll get out of your way. Thank you again so much.